from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Okay, good morning. Uh, in the interest of time and, and to respect those of you who are here on time, I'd like to begin our program. We are being videotaped, and so I would like also to make sure that we can get the full benefit of the resources available to us. Uh, I'm Sandra Charles, a library's physician and chief of the Office of Occupational Medicine and Health Services. And through the core activities of that office, we exemplify and give support to the library's strategic objectives, empowering the workforce, capitalizing on collaborations, and leveraging the strength of diversity in the library's staff, collections, and constituents. And I say that because today's program is sort of a coalition of all those things. Uh, our health and wellness program is one of the core activities that we have, one of the more uh, pleasant core activities that we have. And we see it as a public health function where we're serving a population, the library staff, and we focus on enhancing staff engagement, wellness, and productivity. We're not a very large staff. There are about seven of us, and if there are any health services staff in the room, would you please stand, please? Okay. And I think there are only two missing. <laughs> uh, but all that being said, though we are a small staff, we have strong support from our diverse partnerships that we have both within and outside of the library. And here in the library, the Library of Congress Prof Professional Association, LCPA, and other staff organizations, as well as our two-year-old Wellness Advisory Committee, have been really strong supporters, not to mention several other office and sta offices and staff from across the service units. For example, we have our chair of the Wellness Advisory Committee, Juanita Lyle, a cancer survivor and a staunch and passionate advocate of wellness. She'll be giving our closing. And the series that we advertise, the Brown Bag Series for Living Well, that we do jointly with LCPA was her brainchild. We also have with us today, and the person who will be introducing our speaker is Maureen Cohen Harrington, an Associate General Counsel here at the library. She's also a member of the advisory board for the Congressional Vegetarian Staff Association, which is also represented here today, Adam. And she's an avid inline skater. So I thought she's a perfect role model for the emphasis we're putting on both eating well, good nutrition, and physical fitness. And I must say, before I ask Maureen to come forward, that I see this the coalition as what really makes us strong. So I would say we are a small but mighty force for health and wellness. Or in Jamaican parlance, we are little but talawa. So, <laughs> without further ado, Maureen, would you come forward, please, to introduce our speaker. Oh, there is a dignified way to get up to the stage, and I ignored it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charles. Um, and to clarify, I'm Assistant General Counsel. You gave me a promotion, but uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I am thrilled to welcome Dr. Neil Bernard here to the Library of Congress. Many thanks to all of you for joining us, especially to those of you who had to walk a few buildings over. Um, Dr. Barnard is Adjunct Associate Professor of Medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He's president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's founder of the nonprofit Barnard Medical Center here in DC. He's the author of more than 70 scientific publications and 18 books, including several on the New York Times bestseller list. And he's got a stockpile of other accomplishments, too numerous to mention here, or even in the program, which does go into some more detail. But what I admire about Dr. Barnard is that he's at the forefront of a groundbreaking and in some ways very simple approach to medicine. 
His work shows that our diets can prevent and sometimes even reverse many serious health conditions, including heart disease and some of the others that he'll be discussing here today. We at the Congressional Vegetarian Staff Association have been lucky to have Dr. Barnard at some of our events, so I can personally vouch for what a terrific speaker he is. In case you're wondering how I ended up on the advisory board of a Congressional Staff Association, the CVSA decided a few years ago to welcome its members among its membership library staff. So if you're interested in learning more about the group, please speak with me or to Adam Servana, our president over there. And now it's my pleasure to turn this over to our wonderful and distinguished speaker, Dr. Barnard. Well, thank you, and thanks to all of you for coming. You know, when I was a medical student at GW, uh, we talked about heart disease, but it was a one-way street. You know what I'm talking about. You'll get this disease, you will never get rid of it, and it wasn't just heart disease. Uh, diabetes was that way. Once you had diabetes, you'll always have diabetes. And weight problems were like that, too. You might lose a little bit of weight, but overall these things were regarded as progressive conditions that just don't get better. But we have started to see that there's a very different way of dealing with these diseases, and that's why I've called this lecture Reversing Heart Disease. Just so that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about, garden variety heart disease is in the coronary arteries. So they're called coronary arteries because they crown the heart. And if you look, can you see this okay? Okay. So the coronary arteries are there to provide blood and oxygen for the heart muscle, and the heart muscle can't work unless it gets a good blood supply. But over time, for a lot of people, this nice wide open artery at the top gets gradually clogged, and these blockages can rupture and cause a blood clot, and that's like a cork in a, in a bottle, it just stops blood flow. And back in 1990, Dr. Dean Ornish, is that a f familiar name? Dean Ornish, wanted, he was, he was uh, quite a young doctor at the time. He said, I want to see if we can actually make this disease go away. In other words, he didn't want to just try to prevent it in people who didn't have it. He went into hospitals in the San Francisco Bay Area. He brought in people who had heart disease and wanted to see what he could do. So he, he used an experimental program had four parts. The first part was vegetarian foods. Now, why would you use vegetarian foods in heart patients? Why? Why would you do that? Okay, low fat, high in fiber, no cholesterol. That's right, okay. Uh, secondly, half hour walk every day. Third, manage stress, which is why he didn't do the study in Washington, D.C. Um, avoid tobacco, and that was the whole program. There was no medication used, no surgery, nothing. And he had a comparison group that followed regular medical advice. And after a year, their total cholesterol dropped 24%. LDL, is that familiar? Oh, ba bad cholesterol. Dropped 37%. That's the kind of thing that we use medications for. It happened just from diet change. But what got everybody's attention was that they lost 22 pounds on average. If they were already skinny, they didn't lose any weight. But if they were heavy, they lost a lot of weight. And the average weight loss was 22 pounds in a year without even counting calories. However, what made medical history was something different. Everyone had an angiogram. An angiogram is a special x-ray of the heart. It shows the little trickle of blood that gets through to the heart muscle. And they compared the results at the end to the results at, at the beginning, the angiogram at the beginning. And you could see that the arteries, instead of getting narrower and narrower, were actually opening up again. And the patients felt it because their chest pain was gone, usually within four, five, six weeks. And at the end of a year, you could see measurable changes in 82% of the participants. No surgery, no drugs, just these simple, cheap, low-tech uh, interventions uh, with diet, exercise, and so forth. And then what got the insurance company's attention was, do you have to go back to the hospital? Do we need to operate on you? Or do you die? And the control group, not doing so hot, but the intervention group had a dramatic drop. So this really changed medical history. And now Medicare says, you want this program? We'll pay for it, because it's, it's the best investment that they can make. So heart disease is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. 
but it won't be a two-way street unless we make the kinds of changes that it takes to actually take those clogged arteries and open them up again. We thought that was kind of a heroic thing to do, and it is unless you follow the simple things that your body needs to regain its health. Okay, so are there other parts of the body that need healthy arteries? Are there? Like? Oh, the brain. Yes, this underused organ um, does need some, I mean, this year, but um, the carotid artery goes up and then it splits. Part of it goes to the outside and part of it goes inside, and you can have blockages there too, meaning you may not have a heart attack, you might have a stroke, okay? Um, do we have arteries elsewhere? Sure we do. Um, the lower back. You know anybody who's got chronic back pain? Um, researchers in Scandinavia did the most amazing thing. They started looking at autopsies of people who had, who had died after having had back pain for a long period of time. And they found a couple of things that, well, let me show you this. If you got back pain, you got, you see the, the bony vertebrae there? Those, that's the tan part, those are bones. That's one on top of the other. And between them, the purple part, those are discs. They're like little cushions between, so they keep the bones from bashing into each other. Well, those cushions, at the top, that's normal, but you see, if you look down here, you see that kind of thing ballooning out? That's that cushion. It's like the stuffings coming out of that cushion, and then it presses on a nerve, and that nerve is running all the way down your leg, and so you get what they call sciatica. My, my back is killing me, my legs are killing me, and it's pressure on that nerve. The Scandinavian researchers found if you looked at smokers, they had a lot more of these degenerated discs. Why? Smoke, cigarettes aren't heavy, okay, so it couldn't be that. What is it? And they decided, here's what it is. If you look at the arteries, this is the aorta. There's the heart, and the aorta comes off, and then it loops down, and it goes all the way down and right in front of your spine, and it gives off vertebral arteries to every vertebral segment, and the very first place where the arteries are damaged, where, where, they, where they start to, to narrow, is the vertebral arteries right in the abdominal aorta. So you could be 18 years old, and your heart's maybe okay, but you start losing those arteries. And so the lower back isn't getting blood supply anymore, or not getting very much. And so then if you have trauma on the football field, or you got rear-ended in your car or whatever, the back can't heal anymore. And those discs become fragile and they start to herniate and it's because of a lack of blood flow. Normally your back should be able to have a little bit of wear and tear, but it can't anymore because of a lack of blood flow. Is this making sense? So researchers now think that lower back pain is in many cases not just trauma or bad luck, but in some cases it's a sign of bad blood flow. Okay, surprising? Um, are there other parts of the body that need good blood flow? One of the most popular pills at the pharmacy is this one. All Viagra does. The only thing it does is cause arteries to open up a little bit. And the, the reason is that the, the male sexual anatomy is sort of a hydraulic system that needs good blood flow in order to work properly, if you catch what I'm getting at. And so we see in, in our research center a lot of people with erectile dysfunction. But when they follow the Ornish type of diet, plant-based diet, blood flow opens up again in the heart. And after two or three, four months, I cannot tell you how many men come in and say, my nature is back. <laughs> so anyway, a lot of people are going vegan because it's this macho diet, right? So anyway, there you go. Okay, so we've talked about getting away from the animal products. Animal products are the only source of cholesterol. There's no cholesterol in a bean or a grain of rice or a sprig of broccoli or an apple or plant foods don't have it. But there's a lot of it in meat, dairy products, eggs, and they also have the bad fat, saturated fat, that causes your body to make more cholesterol. Okay? Which leads us to the question of, okay, I believe it. You know, I'm sure if I were vegan, I'd, I'd do great. I'd be slim. I'd be healthier. But wait a minute. Can I do this? Do any of you feel that sometimes foods might be a little bit addictive? 
In other words, even if we'd like to change our diet, we think, I, I don't know, I'm not sure I could do it. What is the most addictive food? At the University of Michigan, 2015, researchers asked this question, what is your most addictive food? And what they, what they meant was, which foods give you a problem? You've already eaten enough, but you just can't resist. They had 384 people. Which foods do you just find yourself eating more than you want to? You can't cut down, you lose control. Well, number five was ice cream. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not hungry, but I just want the taste. Uh, number four, cookies. Number three, chips. Number two, chocolate. And number one, pizza. And who said cheese? I'm going to say it's not the olives, right? I don't think it's the sun-dried tomatoes. I don't think it's even the crust. I think it's that half inch of yellow asphalt over the top of our cheese. Is this making sense? Um, we love cheese. It doesn't love us back, but people get hooked on this. And I am going to argue that cheese is fattening, that it is a little bit addicting, and causes health problems. I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes on, on some of this. Um, what causes our weight problems? Um, a lot of people say it's this, right? Sugar. I'm going to raise a question mark about that. I'm not going to suggest for a second that soda is health food, but if you look at the trend over time, sweeteners went up until 1999, at which point people discovered bottled water. And that started cutting into the, sweeteners, uh, the, the soda market in a serious way. And sugar consumption has been dropping for almost 20 years. But cheese has been going up. <laughs> And where is obesity? It's going right along with cheese. OK? So back in 1909, when the USDA started tracking America's cheese consumption, we really did not eat very much of it. It was kind of a European thing. And in Peoria, you know, we're not going to eat more than, we couldn't eat more than four pounds of cheese in a year. But two things happened. Fast food chains found that burgers had to have cheese on top. And so cheese started making more and more inroads. And then pizza chains came in. And at first, it was a sprinkling, and then it was a layer, and then it was a couple layers. And now, actually, I should update this. In 2017, the average American consumes 35 pounds of cheese every year. That's 60,000 calories worth of cheese every single year. Am I cheering you up? <laughs> um, it's loaded with calories. And where are the calories? This will, be, this will be on the test. Very important. For a gram of sugar has only four calories. And that's true not just of sugar, but any carbohydrate. So you have friends who say, don't eat potatoes. They're fattening, right? Any carbohydrate, whether it's potatoes or bread or fruit sugar, has only four calories in a gram. But a gram of fat has nine calories. So if a person's trying to lose weight, skipping the chicken fat and the beef fat and the cheese fat, causes weight loss much faster than trying to not eat bread. Okay. All right. Um, the leanest beef is about 29% fat. Chicken is not a lot different. 23%. Fish, are, they vary, some lower, some higher. But then if you look at something like broccoli or beans or rice or sweet potatoes, not only do they have no cholesterol, they are very, very low in fat. And that's why people who consume these foods tend to be slim. They tend to lose weight. All right. Cheese, however, 70% fat. If it were any worse, it would be Vaseline. Um, very, very high in fat. And there is Coke Zero, but there is no Cheddar Zero. So there is really no super dietetic cheese. Uh, sodium content is an interesting thing. People are concerned about sodium for a couple reasons. What, what does sodium do? in the body. OK, so your blood pressure will go up. It also causes you to lose a little bit of calcium. But if you have a lot of salt in your diet, you'll keep water weight. And you'll feel bloated and boggy and crummy. So an orange has about a milligram of sodium. An apple has 2, and a brown rice has 20, and a potato has about 13. Potato chips, 330. Two ounces of cheddar, 350, Edom, 500, and Velveeta, 800 milligrams of sodium. They add it, they add it in, the, 
in the dairy because they add more sodium and that stops the bacterial action from over fermenting the cheese. So it's a very, very, very high sodium food. Um, and so why is it fattening? It's high in calories. The food fat it adds easily to body fat. I didn't mention this. Uh, if you eat carbohydrate, like bread, in theory you can make fat out of it, but it's really hard for your body to do. If you eat bread, your body takes the bread and pulls the carbohydrate out and breaks that into sugar molecules that go into the blood, and those sugar molecules power your brain, and they power your muscles. They don't go to fat. But you eat two slices and three slices. You eat half the loaf. Well, eventually your body will say, I don't need this much sugar, and it'll store it in your liver as something called glycogen. Have you heard of this? Uh, people who run marathons, they eat lots of carbs leading up to the race because they want to have glycogen in their liver and their muscles. It's like spare batteries. It's not fat, it's energy. And you say, okay, I'm gonna eat two loaves of bread. Can I eventually get fat out of this? Yes, you can. If you eat way more than your body can store, you'll make fat out of it. But even doing that to turn a bread molecule into a fat molecule burns up about a quarter of, of all of its calories. So it's very hard to gain weight on a high carbohydrate diet, unless you add the cheese and the meat to it, because your body can take the fat out of those and put it straight into your body fat with almost no conversion. Okay, all right. So fat slows down your metabolism. It doesn't have any fiber at all. Cheese has no fiber to control your appetite, and it's got a lot of sodium, which adds water weight. Okay. Um, Researchers have studied Seventh-day Adventists for a long period of time. And when I got involved in research, I couldn't figure out why are you studying Seventh-day Adventists? And the reason, as you, some of you may know, is that it's a very health-conscious population. And by their church uh, principles, you're supposed to avoid tobacco and avoid alcohol and avoid caffeine and avoid meat. And almost all Adventists are very good at the first three of those. Um, so you've got a huge number of people who are non-smoking, health-conscious teetotalers, but some of them eat meat and some don't. Perfect, natural experiment. So uh, in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data. They looked at, at body mass index. Is that a familiar term? Body mass index is your, your weight, but it's adjusted for how tall you are. And they had almost 61,000 people, and they split them into five groups depending on the diets that they followed. And the first group was non-vegetarians, normal, typical American diet. And their body mass index was not below 25 as we would like it to be. It was in the overweight range, 28.8. .8. And the next group was semi-vegetarian. These were people who ate meat but less than once a week. A little slimmer. And then pesco-vegetarian, what's, what's that mean? Okay, so no meat except for fish. And they're a little slimmer but um, but not as slim as the lacto-ovo vegetarians, lacto meaning dairy products, milk products, ovo for eggs, okay. And then vegans, not people from the planet, vegas. Um, the vegans were, the, they don't eat any animal products, and they were the only group that was smack in the middle of the healthy body mass index range, just on average. But then if you compare these last two groups, I'm going to argue that the difference between a person following a lacto-ovo vegetarian diet and a vegan diet is mostly dairy, especially cheese. And if you do the math, that's about a 15-pound difference from the cheese that these people are eating, just, just on average. So it's really true that when your diet is loaded with vegetables and fruits and beans and whole grains and you set the animal products aside, people have a really easy time maintaining a healthy body weight. Okay? But I'm hooked on this. I'm really hooked on this. What's this about? So why do we get hooked? The first thing is the salt content. We, we love salty foods. People love potato chips and french fries and things. The other thing, though, is it's fatty. There's something about a fatty, salty food. Onion rings, french fries, potato chips. That combination tends to get us hooked. But there's a third thing. Anybody heard of casomorphins? The dairy protein is called casein, C-A-S-E-I-N. And casein, protein, like all proteins, if you looked at it under a powerful microscope, it's a string of beads. Each bead is an amino acid, and your body breaks those beads apart. It goes into your blood, and your body uses these protein building blocks. Except casein is different from other proteins. The, the milk protein casein, 
When you ingest it, your body pulls some of the amino acids out and uses them for protein. But other little collections of amino acids come out as little chains of molecules called casomorphins. Casein-derived, morphine-like compounds that go to the brain and attach to the very same brain receptors that morphine or heroin would attach to. And when researchers discover this, the question is, what the heck are they doing there? And they've looked at, at many different species of milk, a, 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 a nursing a cow giving milk to her baby or, or a goat or a horse or any mammal. That milk contains protein. It, it contains sugar, lactose sugar. It contains fat. It contains a fair amount of hormones. Um, but it also has these little opiates in it that we believe may be part of the biological substrate of the mother-infant bond. Look, look at a nursing baby. They have this look of tremendous intensity. And then they collapse into sleep. And you think, isn't that beautiful? You know, the mother-infant bond is so wonderful. I hate to say it, you just drug, you drug the kid, basically. Um, we now believe there are opiates in, well, we know there are opiates in cow's milk. We know that they attach to the, to the brain. So when I take milk, which has a little bit of opiate in it, and I turn it into cheese, everything is concentrated. It's the most concentrated source of casomorphins you can get. And some of us call it dairy crack. Um, <laughs> Be that as it may, we believe this is why people tend to get hooked on cheese and especially on pizza. Now, many people, when they're gaining weight and having trouble, will say, all right, I'm with you. I'm going to go online. I'm going to get the Atkins diet, and, and that's what I'm going to do. And let me caution you about that. Um, these books have been very, very popular because they say the reason that we're heavy is because we're eating too much rice and too much bread and too many potatoes and too many carbs in general. And if you stop eating all those things, you'll lose weight. And that's true, because carbs are half of what we eat. And if you throw out all the potatoes and all the bread and all the rice and all the cookies and all the cakes and all the fruit, you will lose weight, unless you eat more of other things so that your calorie intake doesn't fall, in which case you don't lose any weight at all. There's a whole lot of frustrated dieters out there. So I'm going to suggest that bread is not the issue. Um, so the big problem with this kind of dieting is that these are the foods that are left when you're leaving out uh, the healthy foods. And so if you tuck into these things and your calorie content ends up going up, you aren't going to lose any weight whatsoever. But even when people do lose weight, they very often end up with heart disease. And this uh, was uh, sent to me by a young man named Jody Garan, who said, I want to tell people about what happened to me. He happened to be in the hospital, and he, he had a scan of his heart for, that he didn't really need. He didn't have heart disease, but they did this scan as part of a special physical exam that he, that he had. And I'm not going to ask you to read this, but bottom line, he had no heart disease whatsoever. He was fine. And he was just a little bit overweight, less than 10 pounds overweight. But low-carb dieting was such a fad, he thought, let me do it that way. So he threw out all the bread, and he followed it very, religi you know, very religiously. He was eating gravy and heavy cream, but no bread, no rice, and, uh, no potatoes. And one day, he was walking in, in New York, and an elephant sat on his chest. He had crushing chest pain. He went into the, the emergency room, and he was having a heart attack. And they did an angiogram, and see there's a little place where it's all white, where it should be uh, a good artery. He had a 97% blockage in his heart. And his doctor said, what have you been doing? And he told them what he had been doing. And his diet was so high in cholesterol and animal fat, it's just a recipe for heart disease. Now, normally when you lose weight, your cholesterol should fall. And that often does happen. But on about a third of Atkins dieters, even though they may be losing weight because they're eating fewer calories, their cholesterols go up, sometimes just absolutely through the roof. So he said, forget that, went on a plant-based diet, has had no trouble keeping a healthy weight, and his arteries opened up again. In Australia, researchers found something that shocked all of us who felt maybe we can change our diet in midlife and we're going to be OK. Um, they measured the thickness of the artery wall, which you can do in an adult, and you can do it in a baby. And if you look at, say, the carotid artery, which is the one that goes up to your brain, and you do a, a simple non-invasive test, you can see how thick the artery wall is. And they brought in 
23 women and their brand new babies. Within the first week of life, it turned out that if the mother was eating extra food and she was overweight, her baby was already getting arterial thickening in the womb that you could measure at birth. And then if those same foods are then part of the family's culture, by the time that child is 18, he or she will have lost at least one vertebral artery. And by the time the child is in midlife, virtually all of them will have standard atherosclerotic heart disease, which we had thought was just part of human biology. And we now know that it's related to food, smoking, and other aspects of lifestyle that we can control. So let me shift gears just a little bit. One of the big contributors to heart risk is diabetes. And if you don't mind, I'd like to spend just a couple of minutes on, on diabetes uh, because it's a major contributor, not just to heart disease, but many other issues. In 2003, the National Institutes of Health gave our research team a grant to test a plant-based diet, not for heart disease, but for diabetes. And the idea was to do a head-to-head -head test, a vegan diet versus what we called an ADA diet, American Diabetes Association diet, that meant counting calories and limiting carbohydrate and that kind of thing. 22-week study. And the test that we use for measuring blood sugar control is called A1C. If you have diabetes, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, hemoglobin A1C is a measure of how good your blood sugar control has been for the preceding three months or so. And it should be below seven, at least that's our target. But at the start of the study, our people were not below seven, they were all hovering around eight. And the people on the ADA diet, that's the red line, they had an okay drop of about 0 0.4 points, that's good. But the blue line was the vegan group. They had a drop an abs in absolute per uh, percentage terms of 1.2 uh, absolute percentage points, which was bigger than any oral diabetes medication marketed just on average, and it was huge. And then we followed them over a year, and the people in the control group ended up getting back to where they started. And the people in the vegan group, some of them didn't follow it perfectly, but on average, they were still way better than at the beginning. And we had some people where their diabetes simply went away. And then we just looked at their body weight, and we found there wasn't a dramatic difference between the two. The red line is the ADA folks, and they lost weight, and so did the vegans. The vegans lost a little bit more weight. But the, the important thing here is that the vegan group wasn't trying to lose weight. They were free to eat as much spaghetti as they wanted to. Um, there was no calorie limit whatsoever, but the red line was the people on the ADA diet where they sit down with a dietitian who says, all right, you're eating 1,800 calories a day now. Here's your menu. It adds up to 1,300. Aren't I going to be hungry? Yes, but it's calories in, calories out. You've got to cut your calories if you're going to lose weight. How long do I have to stay on this? until you reach your ideal body weight, which is never. And the patient leaves with this menu, and this gets old by about Wednesday. <laughs> and you are ready to eat the sofa. And then you start berating the patient. You're not compliant. You're non-compliant. Who is going to be compliant with being hungry every single day of their life? And instead, with the people on the plant-based diet, they were free to eat chili. It was just not meat chili. It was bean chili. There's so much fiber in it, it's filling and you push away from the table a little sooner, so your calorie intake actually does fall, but you're totally unaware of it, totally satisfied, and the weight loss is greater on that kind of diet that doesn't cause hunger at all than on a person who's trying to muscle through it and use discipline and willpower. When we want to help our patients comply with it, we don't use willpower at all. You just set up a structure that they can't fail, and they don't have to worry. Is this making sense? Okay, all right. Uh, oh, and LDL, low-density lipoprotein, drops like a stone. You're not eating any animal fat. It always falls. Okay, this is my most important slide. For anybody with diabetes, I, I want to just walk you through this because I guarantee you your friends don't know about this and your doctor does not know about this. Diabetes means there's too much sugar in the blood. That sugar is glucose. And glucose is not bad. Glucose is good. Glucose powers your brain, powers your muscles. The problem in diabetes is that you've got glucose in your blood, not inside the cells where it can do some good. It's building up in the blood, and you can test, you, your blood tests show it. You think if it would only go into my cells, I wouldn't have diabetes, and that's true. Researchers at Yale University use a special kind of test called MR spectroscopy, 
where they scanned people's muscles and their livers, and they found something that completely revolutionized our approach to diabetes. This is a muscle cell, okay? And muscles are where most of the glucose in the blood is trying to go. And so you've got glucose, it's there, those little dots, trying to get into the cell. You've got insulin, insulin's a hormone. It's like a key that opens that cell up, okay? So the glucose needs to get inside, but you need the insulin to do it. So the insulin signals these channels to open up. There's the glucose. It's now going in now because insulin led it in the cell. But there's something else in that cell. See those yellow globs? That's fat. Fat droplets inside the cell. And they build up based on what I've been eating. Now, the doctors hate words like fat. It's got one syllable, three letters. So we refer to it as intramyocellular lipid, but it's, it's fat, inside, intra means inside, myo means muscle, cellular means cellular, lipid means fat. If you eat, it, this comes from food that you're eating, so you eat chicken fat and it goes inside the muscle cells with very little conversion to anything else. You eat cheese fat or dairy fat or fryer grease or whatever, it's inside the muscle and as it goes in there it stops insulin from working. The reason a person develops diabetes is not because they were eating rice or eating potatoes. It's because fat built up inside the cell and it makes your insulin no longer work. And if the insulin doesn't work, the glucose builds up in the blood and you can test it and your doctor says, you've got too much glucose in your blood, you need to start medication. Well, diabetes is not a metformin deficiency. All these drugs do is they try to stimulate more insulin release or make the cell react more. And until the Yale researchers scanned patients with diabetes and found fat inside their cells, we weren't able to tackle the cause. So why did our research participants who had diabetes do better on a vegan diet? Because there's no animal fat in the diet at all. And if you keep the vegetable oils low, do you know what happens inside that cell? The fat starts dissipating, the insulin starts working again, and you've got a shot of getting rid of your diabetes or having it improved dramatically and needing less medication, sometimes none at all, because you're tackling the cause, okay? So if you know anybody who's got diabetes and they're saying, I'm not gonna eat any bread, take out a napkin and start drawing my cell and showing the fat globs inside, and that is your target. A low-fat vegan diet will cause diabetes to start turning around. Weight comes down, cholesterol comes down, blood sugars come down. In some cases, they are never going to know they had it. We uh, did a study recently with people who had late-stage diabetes, where, as you know, diabetes attacks the eyes. It attacks the kidneys. It attacks your feet so that your, your nerves aren't working well. You, you get numb or sometimes you get pain. And the, the nerves of the hands, same story. One of our participants was a jazz bass player. And he had neuropathy in his hands. And after about one or two songs, he, he, he had to stop. And he would turn his back to the audience and just shake his hands out to, to try to get his nerves working again. And then he could play another song or two. And they'd have to stop. He came in to our uh, research center, went on a plant-based diet. And a plant-based diet, keeping oils low too, what does it do to the cell? causes that fat to come out, the insulin starts working again, it brings his blood sugar down, suddenly the nerves aren't being attacked by that persistent high blood sugar and, and narrowed arteries. And after about two or three months, he said, I can play again. And he could play through a whole set without any problem. And two months after that, he came in and said, my erectile dysfunction is gone. <laughs> so <laughs> high fives all the way around the room. <laughs> anyway, it's, it's really true. You know, that does not happen by just filling a prescription. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't fire your doctor, and there are times when medicines are really important and sometimes life-saving. But if you are not tackling the cause and the cause relates to diet, we just got one arm tied behind our back. Okay, so plant-based diets, they improve cholesterol levels, they improve body weight, they improve blood pressure, they improve, di improve diabetes. And so this is the graphic that we developed back in 2009 for, to summarize what a healthy diet is. So it's fruits, it's grains, it's vegetables, it's legumes. And by the way, we brought this to the USDA um, and said, why don't you scrap the pyramid? Because in 2009, there, there was the pyramid. And the pyramid wasn't terrible, but it had a meat group and a dairy group. And the people who don't eat those at all are healthier than the people who do. So we said, get rid of them. And, and by the way, people eat off a plate. Give them a plate. And 
We didn't hear back from them. Um, so in 2011, we actually filed suit against the USDA um, just to compel response. And I don't know if you saw what the USDA came out with in 20, 2011. Um, I'm not taking any credit for this, but it does look remarkably similar <laughs> to what this, this is now called my, this is my plate. And it's fruits, it's grains, it's vegetables. They, they call it the protein group which could be meat, but it could also be beans or tofu or nuts or other high protein foods. It doesn't have to be meat. And there's the dairy group, but to their credit, they said, soy milk counts, veganite is good. So this is now, that's my plate, this is now US government policy. So it's not perfect, but it's definitely going in very much in the right direction. Um, okay, let me skip this, I already showed you that. So by now you might be saying, okay, great, sure. I, I love it, this is, this is really gonna work great, but if I do this vegan diet, I'm going to have to live in the garage because my family isn't going to want me around and uh, nobody's going to invite me out to dinner and this will be impossible and what am I going to do? So we break this diet change into two steps. I want to share it with you and encourage you to try this. I have never seen anyone unable to do it. Very, very easy. The first step is don't change your diet. For the first seven days, all we're going to do is check out the possibilities. So whatever you're eating, try out things that happen to be vegan and see if you like them. So I take a sheet of paper and I write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack on the paper and for the next week you just write down things that work and test them out. So I haven't had oatmeal since I was a kid. Maybe with some cinnamon and some strawberries and blueberries, maybe it would taste okay. Um, blueberry pancakes, I guess I could do that without the butter. That's not so hard. Um, I haven't tasted almond, almond milk. Ha have we tasted almond milk? Is it good? All right, okay, fair enough. So you know that, you know, might try oat milk or hemp milk or something else. Just try these different things, same for lunch. I never had a pizza without cheese. How is it? I don't know, let's see. Um, so all we're doing for week one is checking out the possibilities. We go to an Italian restaurant and the chef is more than happy to serve you angel hair pasta with a spicy tomato sauce and wild mushrooms and artichoke hearts and so forth and pasta fajol and um, healthy things. Mexican restaurant, beans and rice, bean burritos, veggie fajitas. Uh, Chinese, they, they got dozens of things, vegetable dishes, rice dishes, tofu dishes. Uh, extra points for Japanese because it's often delicate and low in fat. So the veggie sushi or the salads and so forth are great. Um, and if you're at Subway, can I get a vegan sandwich at Subway? Sure. Uh, they put on the lettuce and tomatoes and onions and olives and pickles and so forth and spinach and little red wine vinegar and they'll toast it for you and call it Veggie Delight. And Taco Bell is not the pinnacle of culinary art, but they will be more than happy to give you a bean burrito, hold the cheese and all right, so fair enough. So for the first week, I'm just checking out the possibilities and then after that, do three weeks, all vegan, all the time, but only 21 days because you're just testing this diet out to see what you think. At the end of 21 days, two things will have happened. First is you are physically changing and you will feel it. You'll have lost weight without trying. If you have diabetes, you'll discover your glucose numbers are improving. Your energy is better. Your digestion sorts itself out usually within about 24 or 48 hours. You just feel dramatically different. Your energy is better. Um, anybody watch the Super Bowl, Tom Brady, as you probably know, he threw out the cheese a long time ago. Aaron Rodgers at Green Bay, same story. They're doing this not because they want to have a healthier figure. They're doing this for energy and to stop inflammation. Um, but you, you will feel this even if you're not a pro football quarterback. You discover all those inflammation, my joints, I'm better. I feel better. So that happens in about 21 days. Um, the second thing that happens, though, is your tastes change, and you didn't expect this. But let me ask this group, how many of you ever switched from whole milk to skim milk? Let me see hands. Okay, when you did, what was the skim milk like at the beginning? Watery? Doesn't even look right, it's kind of blue color. How many of you adapted to it, got used to it? Okay, did you ever go back and taste whole milk again? What was that like? It's like cream, it's, like, it's, it's, it's thick. Well, wait a minute, your whole life it was fine. But when you get a short break of even a few weeks, your taste buds physically adjust. They no longer want the fatty taste, but you will never have that experience if you have a vegan meal on Monday and then one on Thursday. Because in between, you're reawakening that fatty desire in your taste buds. If just for a short period, like three weeks, you say, I'm not going to have it. 
It's like a smoker not having cigarettes. You, forget, you finally forget about it. But you crave today what you had yesterday. And you give yourself a 21-day break, and it gives you power you didn't have before. So that's why we say just do it for, for, for three weeks. There are transitional foods like veggie bacon, veggie sausage, if you want. It's kind of like a meat eater's methadone. Um, you can have it if you want. You don't have to have it, but it's there. Um, we have a program for you. I want to walk you through a couple of resources, and I'll finish with this. At the Physicians Committee, we started something called the 21-Day Vegan Kickstart, and we started at the beginning of every month, as in March 1st. And if you sign up, it's totally free. What you get is uh, emails from celebrities and doctors and athletes. We have a free app, and every day it's menus, recipes, cooking videos, all kinds of stuff. And it's in English, Spanish, Mandarin. We have one for people from the Indian subcontinent with um, English language but Indian ingredients. We have a Japanese program as well, all free. We've had more than a half a million people go through this, so please do it. Um, and for people with heart disease, let me recommend Dean Ornish has a book. And Caldwell Esselstyn, you probably, when Bill Clinton was talking a lot about heart disease, these were the guys that were always on the news because they're the pioneers. And John McDougall also has been terrific. Um, my own books, I've got a number of them, and The Cheese Trap is coming out next week. Uh, please do let your cheese-addicted friends know about that. Um, and for any uh, nurses, doctors, healthcare people in the audience, please join us in July. GW and the Physicians Committee are teaming up now for the fifth International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine, over, right over here at the Hyatt, uh, Grand Hyatt near the White House. And it's two days of everything you need to know about nutrition and applying it in medicine. Um, finally, we felt that when people come in with diabetes or high blood pressure and only medications are used, that we're not really tracking the cause. So a year ago, we opened the Barnard Medical Center to use medications when we need to, but to go to the cause for everybody. And that means a nutritional approach is offered to every, every patient. If you have trouble, we don't fire you. you uh, we love all our patients, but we help everybody. We have three dietitians on staff and classes all day, every day, that's all free. And so come see us. We're up right up Wisconsin Avenue. We take all insurances, and, we, and it's a nonprofit, um, but it's a cool place to go. And uh, even if you don't want to be a clinic patient, we have classes for the public free. We'd love to have you come, okay? Um, the last thing that I just want to say is when people make changes, the most important issue, I think, isn't necessarily our own health. I think it's the next generation. When you look at kids, they're eating foods that our parents and grandparents never heard of. And there are seductions on the way home from school, on TV. Half the commercials on TV are now for snack foods. The other half are me medications to undo the effects of the snack foods. And that's the world that our kids now think is normal. When I'm older, I'm going to be on medications. And I'm going to eat these foods. And now kids are overweight before they get their high school diploma. They've got the beginnings of heart disease. One in three now has prediabetes or diabetes. We've got to change that. Whether you're concerned about the money for health care or what really counts, which is our family's going to be OK. Are they going to be able to stay together? Um, that's why we need to do two things. We need to experiment with healthy foods, and then we need to make some noise about it. But I'm not a finger wagger head person. It's not, this is not a question of guilt. It's a question of having fun and trying some things. So you experiment with foods. You find the ones you like. If you find recipes or products or books or DVDs that you like, share them around. And you're going to have some duds when you experiment with a new lasagna or whatever. That's OK. That's what experimenting is all about. But find the foods you like, share them around, make some noise, and I'm convinced we can change the health of this country. Thanks very much. Thanks. Um, can I, is it okay if I take questions for a couple of minutes? Is we all right? Okay. Uh, please. Okay. Yes. Sure. Um, the question is, what about stress? What role does it play? Um, I think it plays a 
couple of roles. Um, one is that when a person is under either acute or chronic stress, the body releases hormones, uh, stress hormones, cortisol and others. And that these do have a variety of health effects. That's number one. Number two, when you're stressed, is this not true? We will eat anything just to get through that period. Um, so April 12th, 13th, 14th is not a time when an accountant is going to follow an especially great diet. When we're stressed, we let other things go. So stress is, is an issue, and you should all win the lottery and quit your jobs and have a stress-free existence. Um, contrary to that, though, uh, in World War II, pathologists who were looking at people who died in, of old age um, or also soldiers on the battlefield, what they found was that those who were under deprivation, don't say like in Belgium, places where the Nazis came and took over, took the meat, took the cheese, left the local population with potatoes and vegetables, their arteries started to clear up, even though they were arguably, arguably under tremendous stress. So I think it is good to contain stress, but even if you have a lot of stress in your life, when people are on a healthful diet, they seem to do well. There was a question over here? Yes. What about oil? oil. Yeah, was there a particular issue about oil or question? Okay, um, oil is um, as high in calories as any other fat. So if a person is trying to lose weight, we not only want to avoid the animal fat, it's good to keep the vegetable oils low too. So even extra virgin, even extra, extra virgin olive oil still has nine calories per gram. You remember that number? Um, so for weight loss, it's good to keep fatty foods low, and that includes things like peanut butter and even guacamole, which has a lot of fat in it. Um, Vegetable oils are different from animal fat in that they don't have a lot of saturated fat that raises your blood cholesterol. And our friends in Spain and in Italy argue for what they will call the Mediterranean diet, which is not a butter type diet, it's more an olive oil type diet. And they will point to heart benefits from a Mediterranean diet. Now, Mediterranean diet isn't just oil. It's also less meat, more vegetables. Uh, some people will argue that red wine is a key ingredient. Um, all these things may work together to create health effects. So oil is better than animal fat, but for weight loss, that's one reason to keep it kind of low. Uh, yes, please. Are you concerned about soy? Um, in, about soy, is there a particular issue about soy that you have? Okay, I'm really glad that, glad that you asked that because um, the argument goes like this. Soy has estrogens in it that will cause boys to become effeminate and cause girls to have a higher risk of breast cancer is what they'll say. Um, the, here's the, the truth of this. Back in 1921, some compounds were identified in soy called isoflavones. And they look vaguely like sex hormones. They are not sex hormones, but they look vaguely like it. And if you, however, look at men who consume a lot of soy. A, they are not effeminate. B, there is no reduction in fertility. As you can quickly see when you go to any country like China or Japan where soy is a big part of the diet, uh, fertility has not been impaired. Um, but most importantly when it comes to breast cancer, there have now been, I believe, uh, at least 35 or 40 studies on women who consume a lot of soy, their breast cancer risk is cut by about 30 to 40 percent. In other words, soy somehow has the opposite effect. And I don't know why, and I'm not even necessarily pushing soy. Um, it's very convenient. You, you know, you're better off with soy sausage than pork sausage. Uh, you don't need it, but women who consume a fair amount of soy have much less risk of developing breast cancer. And women who have had breast cancer in the past, if they consume more soy, their risk of recurrence is about 30 percent less. And that's important because a lot of them are told by their well-meaning but ill-informed doctor, I, th I read somewhere you shouldn't have soy if you had breast cancer. And the women who avoid soy have the highest recurrence rate. Uh, so I'm not pushing soy, but, but it, it, does, it seems to have these health benefits. Time for maybe one last question? Yeah. Ah, excellent question. What about supplements? I only, there's really only two that I think people should really think about. Number one is vitamin B12. You need it for healthy nerves and healthy blood. And I believe everyone should take a B12 supplement. Second, vitamin D normally comes from the sun. And when we had the good sense to stay in equatorial Africa, 
we got lots and lots of vitamin D. But some of us had the bad judgment to move to places like North Dakota, where I grew up, or New Jersey, or Washington, D.C. And even if there's a lot of sun, we're indoors. So a vitamin D supplement makes sense. Uh, how much? About 2,000 international units a day is safe. Uh, for vitamin B12, you need 2.4 micrograms, but there's no pill that small. So any vitamin B12 pill you take has more than enough, and it's non-toxic, even if you swallow the whole bottle. Um, so that's, that's really it. There are other supplements sold, but they are only used for particular applications and mostly unnecessary. Um, yes, one last question? Sure. Can I ask this question? Okay. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Okay, all right, fabulous. Okay, what a good group you are. These are, these are these excellent questions. Okay, you do need a little bit of iodine, and there's not a lot of sources, and it's true. There are uh, salts that have iodine added to it, and that's good. It's good for your thyroid gland. But there are also natural foods like seaweed that have it. So when you're going to the Japanese restaurant with all your friends and having the cool vegan sushi and getting the admiration of the serving staff, um, you're also getting iodine along with it. All right. Well, thank you for letting me share this time with you. I really appreciate it. And thanks to the organizers as well. Thank you. Thank you. One of the things that I have shared through the year, because I am a four-time um, cancer survivor, and I have, m most of my survival has been because I have been following a plant-based diet uh, just about all of my life. And so even though I got breast cancer um, in the late stages of it, um, the plant the plant-based diet for me was part of my survivor and um, through the years um, you had written this book which was a good book that I've shared with many cancer survivors through the year because it wasn't out when I first got it but uh, this came out I believe it's 2008 or 2009 and this is an excellent book for those to um, to share with others and even if you're not necessarily um, someone that's a cancer survivor. This book itself is a real good book because it, it really bases on really pretty much what Dr. Bernard has been um, actually doing. And this is the name of the book. But he has several other good books, but this is an excellent book um, to have actually in there. And he has some incredible um, recipes in there too that I've tried through the years as well. So, uh, Dr. Medard, I am so happy that I finally um, met um, one of my idols along. I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to, doc to meet Dr. Ornish because I've followed him through the years. But I thank you so very much, um, everyone. Um, I thank you all for continuing to support our Living Well, um, Mind, Body, and Spirit um, brown bags, and we will have an exciting um, speaker on March the 15th that will be coming. So look out for that as well. So thank you so much for your, your coming and, and sharing all this wealth with our audience. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.